We're continuing our coverage of the Crew Dragon's approach to the International Space Station. We're still in the rendezvous phase, completing some major burns. Uh, thanks for tuning in. If you just tuned in, you may have seen some great views from here. This is the view of the International Space Station. It's flying 262 statue miles over the Terminator line into the Southern Pacific Ocean. So you might have seen some great sunrise views uh, as we cross over that section. Now, it's been a great uh, ride so far. We just came out of the crew's sleep period uh, and, and performed some burns during that sleep period. Performed three, actually. One was a phase burn uh, to get in line for the next big burn that will raise, that eventually did raise Dragon's orbit to an apogee of 10 uh, kilometers. That was called the boost burn. Uh, that was just a minute and a half long burn. And we just completed one called the closed coalyptic burn. This was one of the longer burns that we have during Dragon's flight. It was a 10 minute minute burn and it just keeps us at a co-elliptic orbit uh, right underneath the station uh, 10 kilometers underneath the station and of course a little bit behind it we still have a few milestones to go uh, so in the meantime we're going to be taking some questions using the hashtag ask NASA so keep sending those in this first one and I think it's a very important question yes. Michael it comes from Chris who's asking greetings from Canada uh, we're getting greetings from all over the world today That's great. Uh, he's asking what was crew one's wake up call song we had the very same question. Uh, we did not hear it over open dragon to ground. Uh, so we asked ourselves the same thing and found out it was in the air tonight by Phil Collins. Uh, everyone gets to choose, you know, the, uh, the wake up song. Uh, so that was the one for, for crew one today. Yeah, that would get me going, definitely. I could just imagine <laughs> humming it right now. So hopefully that gave them the energy they needed for this big day. Uh, the next question we have is uh, from Steph asking who makes the decision on who the astronaut will be for these missions and how do they make that decision? It's not a random lottery. I'm sure there's a lot of planning that goes into deciding who is who's chosen for which missions, right, Gary? That's right. There is an astronaut corps and they have a, a chief astronaut who is among the many that uh, define the selections. Uh, they, they evaluate all of the different astronauts and of course you see a lot of the astronauts that are on the flight today. Mike Hopkins, an experienced astronaut who stayed aboard the International Space Station, has natural leadership skills uh, he's as was said among many of the crewmates uh, Victor Glover who is a first-time flyer yes but has over 3,000 hours of flight experience in different uh, different airplanes doing some test flying uh, a very capable pilot of and he is the pilot for crew one and of course he's flanked by uh, by Soichi Noguchi and uh, Shannon Walker who are joining them on this mission uh, just part of that selection to, to, to round out the crew it's a very diverse crew really representing international partners uh, and different expertise uh, and what's nice about that is that it complements uh, having a larger crew complement on the International Space Station. This is the largest crew we've had for an expedition, and that's what Crew Dragon is doing today. It's delivering four new crew members to the International Space Station for a long duration stay, and that is the first time that we've had that many, seven, seven long duration crew members. Really, really some fantastic stuff. Yeah, and speaking of some of the qualifications of, of, of the astronauts, when you look at uh, the PhDs that Shannon Walker and Suichi Noguchi have, if you want to give your experience to anyone to run in space, uh, <laughs> they're, you're in pretty good hands with them. So uh, another question we have here uh, asking, uh, can the astronauts contact their families in space? The answer is yes. Uh, yes, they can. They, uh, they can use email, but they do a lot of phone calls too. So they're in constant communication with their families. Uh, they place those calls. Although their day is scheduled down to every five minute interval, they're definitely given time to make uh, kind of keep in touch and communicate with home. It makes uh, makes the journey that much easier, both for our astronauts and for uh, their families. And a lot of them take full advantage of that, Michael. I uh, got a chance to listen to some of the interviews of Mike Hopkins before he launched to his flight, and he was asked the very same question. What's it like, you know, talking to family? How often do you get to do so? Uh, and he talked about calling his, his wife uh, multiple times per week. Uh, so much so that it became regular and one of my favorite moments is when he said he called his wife from space and she said sorry honey I gotta go I can't talk <laughs> it's not a good you know, time it's yeah. just like it's not a good time it's so regular right it's like good. if you and I got a call from space we'd be we'd drop everything right oh, to sure. take that call but it becomes so regular them talking to their friends and family uh, that it's just it's it, it is special yes but it, but yeah. that re that regularity actually maintains that connection with with your loved ones and something that's very important uh, for for life aboard the International Space Station all right, this next one comes from Justin. Do they have any movies or entertain, entertainment when in Dragon? 
So for Dragon, not really, not a whole lot, but I know in the International Space Station, uh, movies and entertainment, very common up there, especially when you have uh, you know multiple folks together. Uh, they do uh, upload and even stream movies and sports events, including the, uh, the, the missions. They've actually even live streamed some of the missions, uh, like when Demo 2 was heading up, uh, uh, ISS Commander Chris Cassidy was kind of watching that live uh, as we were. Um, watching them, you know, come up. So yes, we they definitely can uh, can watch entertainment and movies uh, mainly on the ISS. Uh, another question we have here is why do you have to complete leak checks before opening the hatch? This is actually a very important step before opening up the hatch. The leak checks really give the confidence that you can open up the hatch and that it will remain um, within a pressurized environment. So this is something that we can actually look forward to very soon uh, when the crew is about to do that approach initiation burn shortly afterwards. Uh, well, beforehand they're gonna suit up and, and they're gonna get back in their spacesuits, but shortly afterwards they'll conduct a leak check because we wanna make sure that there is an airtight seal with all of the suits. Now when Dragon docks to the International Space Station, there's actually a gap in between the hatch of the Dragon and the hatch of the International Space Station. That gap is called the vestibule. The vestibule is normally exposed to the vacuum of space. Uh, so it has some, uh, it, you know, the, the, the very cold temperatures of space uh, that you hear about now. Uh, whenever you start repressurizing that vestibule, those temperatures uh, can take some time to, to dampen out. They, they cause temperature swings whenever you're bringing that vestibule uh, to pressure, the pressure of the International Space Station, which is the pressure at sea level 14.7 PSI. Uh, so you want to wait, wait for those uh, pressure, those temperature swings to dampen out and make sure you have a steady pressure that's holding uh, before you actually open it uh, because you want to make sure that when you open it, it's going to be a safe environment for all the crew members involved. Yeah, you want to minimize that delta P, that difference in pressure, exactly. so you don't open up the door into a vacuum. It should just be like opening up a door at home. It should be safe and controlled and, uh, and, and, and yeah, best for uh, both sides of, of that hatch. Um, we have one more question for you here from Will, asking, uh, will the astronauts be wearing their spacesuits during docking like they did on Demo 2? Uh, they said, I remember the spatial astronauts did not wear suits for docking. That's right, and they will, right? Uh, as I mentioned before, once they get into that dynamic phase of flight, they're gonna put on their spacesuits before that approach initiation burn and perform a leak check afterwards, and they'll keep those spacesuits on through the more dynamic phases of that flight. As soon as they dock and they perform that uh, hard mate with the uh, International Space Station, there's a couple phases to that docking. First is a soft dock, and then the 12 latches hold on to the International Docking Adapter performing an airtight seal. Right at then, they can start taking off uh, their spacesuits, but that, that uh, spacesuit just makes sure that in the event of any depressurization that the crew uh, will be able to maintain pressure that'll keep them protected from any depressurization event. Yeah, same reason as the last question, exactly. Yeah. So. Wow, these questions have been great so far, Michael. This has been awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Uh, what a what a fantastic yes. shift this has been. You know, it seems like the crew was sleeping through a lot of the time, but there was a lot of action through all of that, right? Oh, we sure. got through a lot of the major milestones today. Uh, we introduced another phase burn, which was not part of the nominal plan, but it corrected us and got us right into where we needed to be uh, to perform that boost burn and the closed co-elliptic burn, burn, which both performed nominally. So that will actually do it for Michael and I here in uh, Mission Control Hawthorne and Sandra over in Houston. Our counterparts, Jesse Anderson and Leah Cheshire and Brandy Dean are gonna take it over from here. While we uh, swap positions uh, and leave our desks here, we're gonna leave you with views uh, of the International Space Station and hopefully soon with the crew as they make their way to the ISS. Don't go anywhere, it only gets more exciting from here.
Dragon SpaceX for post wake systems brief when you're ready. And SpaceX is a Dragon, we are ready. Bobby, so overnight uh, we kept mo we continue to monitor the TCS system, and uh, everything's looking healthy. TCS performance is uh, looking good on both loops. Prop heaters also continue to perform nominally. And cabin environments have been stable. Okay, we copy. Uh, you monitored TCS overnight. All looks good. Same with the heaters, and uh, basically everything is looking nominal at this time. Good readback. Can you? Uh, we also get some words from you on how cabin temperature is feeling and whether you had to make any changes overnight. So we did uh, bump it up three increments uh, this morning. And I'm currently showing 23.91 degrees C. So it has brought it up a little bit. Copy, we see the same. Uh, regarding the bag swap, uh, we've gotten confirmation. Okay, Jay, and then a couple things for you, just uh, from a system status for us, uh, the tablets, state of charge, if you're ready to copy. Ready to copy. MS-1, 6-0, Commander, 6-8, Pilot, 8-6, MS-2, 6-4. And copy all. Okay. Um, other than that, we're just uh, finalizing a few clean cleanup activities, and then we should be able to get you guys on board here. Copy. Uh, yeah, no rush. Uh, the main item we'd like to get on board for is going to be the Lyle swap. Uh, it's currently scheduled for 1900. However, uh, we're okay if you start slightly later if you start at 1905 when we are over the guam ground station we'd like to get video on board of that activity okay we copy that so we will start at 1905 that'll be uh, shannon suichi that'll be uh, working that at the time copy that and then regarding the bag swap question um the camera bag has two commercial imax inside that were intended for quick access but as brief pre-launch, uh, the CCMK meets that easy access need, so you can move the bag at your discretion. Uh, we also looked at CG. There's about well, one and a half pound delta between the bags, uh, so that is also safe to do. Okay, so it sounds like our call on moving those bags, so uh, we will just plan on doing that at the, for the docking. We'll leave, uh, we'll swap them, uh, the camera bag and the sleeping bags. Yeah, it's a good read back. Uh, we are still tracking that after docking, you know, you want to swap back to the original location, but we can discuss that uh, later. Yep, we concur. Um, I'll have to get out those sleeping bags anyway at that point. Copy all. And if you have any other stowage uh, deltas from yesterday or overnight that you'd like to pass on ahead of docking, we can also copy those. Okay, I know Shannon has been keeping track of everything. Um, I'll let her make a call if she's ready or um, we might do that in a little bit. Copy. Yeah, not time critical. Uh, we'll, we'll be ready when you are. Hey, Jay, on that one, I think what we'll do is after our next meal, uh, we'll probably call it down, and that'll just make it simpler for us in terms of how we're tracking things. So uh, after the next meal. Sounds great. Thanks.
Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. I'm Leah Cheshire, and uh, we have returned and Crew Dragon is still on their journey to the International Space Station after launching last night at 7.27 p.m. Eastern Time aboard the Falcon 9 rocket at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a lead manufacturing engineer here at SpaceX. We're excited to be back with you guys today, um, taking you all the way through docking. And we just heard the core, the crew operations and resources engineer, a position here in Hawthorne, speaking with the crew aboard Crew Dragon, who, as you've heard, have woken up after getting hopefully a good night's rest. They've got a busy day ahead of them. Uh, it was their post-wake systems brief. So they monitored the thermal control system, or the TCS, overnight. And sounds like everything is still operating nominally. That's great news after we were monitoring some prop heater issues last night. They were eventually resolved and uh, everything was brought back up to nominal state. Uh, cabin environments are stable and the crew turned up the temperature a little bit last night to get a little bit cozier inside Crew Dragon. It's about 75 degrees Fahrenheit inside the capsule right now. The crew also reported the state of charge on their tablets that they use inside the capsule. Uh, and additionally, there's a lithium Hydroxide swap uh, scheduled to scrub some CO2 from the cabin atmosphere. That's scheduled for 11.05 a.m. Pacific time. And the next crew meal, uh, after the next crew meal, they will call down with any stowage updates. They were discussing the camera bags and also the sleeping bags. Everything aboard Crew Dragon is very meticulously tracked. And so we want to make sure we know where all of that content is. But a nice recap this morning for the crew. It sounds like everything is going well aboard Crew Dragon, and we are here uh, continuing the docking coverage. Um, we've got uh, their next morning meal should be coming up next, and uh, they will be using or eating the MREs, these meals ready to eat. Um, as we mentioned before, these are meals that are prepared and ready for them to just open up and eat. They don't need to rehydrate or reheat them. Um, and they've also got uh, 55 liters or 14 and a half gallons of water up there with them. Yeah, and I'm not sure what their breakfast is today, but I'm guessing it's probably not bacon and eggs because, <laughs> uh, you know, MREs, there's, like you mentioned, you just open them up and eat them. There's no reheating required. I know a very popular food there, um, especially on the space station, are, are meal bars, you know, like a protein bar we might mm -hmm. have down here. It's portable, it's easy to eat. So I'm wondering if their breakfast might be a little something like that. Yeah, makes it really convenient, especially being inside of Dragon in such a small capsule for the for 24 hours, uh, makes it so that they don't have to even think about it. They can just pull it out, eat it, eat those protein bars or, or something similar to that. Absolutely. Now the next major milestone coming up will be the transfer burn, which will be the fourth of five major burns. And we've already seen a few of those completed. Last night, mm -hmm. while we were on console, we saw the phase burn complete. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the crew had a little bit of a break until this morning. Around the time they woke up, the next major burn, there were a couple of small ones in between just to correct Dragon's uh, location. But the next was the boost burn. And we also completed the closed co-elliptic burn. And uh, I think you said the next one coming up is the transfer burn. Yeah. And just as you mentioned, um, they did have five plans burn, but they did do an extra phase burn. That's just to keep Dragon on track, uh, making their way to the International Space Station. And with the Crew-1 astronauts now awake on Dragon, let's check in on what's happening aboard the International Space Station, their destination, with Brandy Dean at Mission Control Houston. Brandy. Thanks, Leah. As work on the Crew Dragon kicks off for the day, the Expedition 64 crew on board the International Space Station is actually wrapping up their time for the day. And NASA astronaut Kate Rubens just started her sleep period at 11.30 a.m. Central Time, and her Russian crewmates are going to be heading off to bed in about three hours. Rubens is doing the sleep shifting to ensure that she is well-rested and prepared for the Dragon docking that's coming up. At the time of docking, it's going to be late in the evening Monday for us, but actually early morning for the crew on board the space station as they follow the GMT time on their schedule. 
Kate's going to be waking up just before Dragon executes the approach and initiation burn, the first maneuver to begin the approach to the space station. She'll set up the station's cupola module with a number of computers and camera views to monitor Dragon during its approach. And a lot of work has been done on the space station before we got to this day to make sure we were launching Dragon and this new crew to a fully functional orbiting laboratory. Several hours before the crew boarded Dragon, the space station flight control team did their own go, no-go poll. And there are several key systems that we have to ensure are functioning properly before NASA gives their go for launch. Luckily, they are war. And right now, everything is still looking good on the space station side for Dragon's arrival. The team here in Mission Control is actually uh, down the hall from the room where most of the ha action happened yesterday. They're being led right now by Flight Director Paul Konya at the moment. But Flight Director Anthony Varia, Varia will be uh, coming on console in the uh, International Space Station Flight Control Room in just a few hours to lead the teams through Dragon's approach and docking. That is all for us now here in Houston. So back to Hawthorne. Thanks, Brandy. Now you all have sent in some really great questions over the course of this mission. Please keep them coming and sending them in using the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter. And our next question comes from John asking if there's any cargo on the Crew-1 mission. Yes, there is. Obviously, the most precious cargo is our crew themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, additionally, there are some science experiments that are aboard Crew Dragon and uh, will be unloaded and then begin work on those once the crew arrives. The trunk can carry unpressurized cargo, but on this mission, uh, there is no unpressurized cargo in the trunk. Our next question is uh, greetings from Belgium. And how long is the training after you are selected as an astronaut? Well, hello in Belgium. That's pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, the training after being selected to become an astronaut is typically about two years. Astronauts go through really extensive training, but over a variety of subjects. So it can be anything from learning how to spacewalk, like in our neutral buoyancy laboratory. It's a massive pool uh, where astronauts, you can simulate what it's a little bit like to be in microgravity. They have a big space station aboard the International Space Station, aboard the International Space Station, and for years now have been launching on Soyuz spacecraft, so they learn that as well. They also learn um, any emergency scenarios that may happen aboard the International Space Station. We have a big mock-up facility where they learn what to do in case of an emergency, and they also learn how to uh, operate any scientific equipment they might use. Additionally, they learn how to repair things on the station. And then once they're selected for a mission, they begin another training period that's a little more mission specific. So you get those two years initially and then a variable amount of time once they're assigned to a mission. That doesn't sound too bad. It sounds more like fun than a job, actually, getting to try out all this stuff and, and simulate uh, microgravity. <laughs> I agree 100%. I mean, no two days are the same, and that's pretty cool to me. All right. <laughs> got another question from David. Why don't we see the inside view of the four of them live more often? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we do like to give the astronauts some privacy as they are coasting to the International Space Station. It is a long ride, so they do let us come on board with them every once in a while, and we do let you guys know when they do, and we do show, th show them live, which is really awesome views, but we do allow them to have privacy, so whenever they ask, they do turn off their internal camera. Um, we do get some external live views from Dragon, but it's really up to the crew to let us know when we're able to come on board with them. Yeah, absolutely, and there's also the, the factor of sometimes we don't have video communications with them. We might be out of the range of the satellites right. that receive our video communications, mm -hmm. um, but we'll still have audio communications, so that's sometimes why you hear them and don't necessarily see them. Right. Speaking of hearing them, this question, what are these beep, 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 <laughs> beep noises while we're watching SpaceX and NASA right now? I, this is really cool. It's called a Quindar, actually, and it's uh, the little tone that you hear just before somebody is speaking to the International Space Station or to the astronauts um, or the astronauts are speaking to the ground. So for everyone, it used to clear the airwaves, so to speak, and now it really just perks your ears up and you know <laughs> that there's some really important information coming that you should pay attention to. 
basically like an alert, like, hey, we're about to talk. Right. Mm -hmm. Got another one from Matthew. Is any of the capsule, uh, is any of capsule resilience reusable? How much of the rocket and delivery system re is reusable or repurposed for? It's a really great question because SpaceX's uh, goal is to try and make as much of our vehicles and our um, products reusable. So resilience is going to be refurbished and reused, um, hopefully for the next crew.